very late one night, knocked, and when his enemy opened the door, shot him dead. Pushed the corpse inside the door with his foot, set the house on fire, and burned up the dead man, his widow, and three children. I heard this story from several different people, and they evidently believed what they were saying. It may be true, and it may not. Give a dog a bad name, etc. Slade was captured once by a party of men who intended to lynch him. They disarmed him and shut him up in a strong log house and placed a guard over him. He prevailed on his captors to send for his wife so that he might have a last interview with her. She was a brave, loving, spirited woman. She jumped on a horse and rode for life and death. When she arrived, they let her in without searching her, and before the door could be closed, she whipped out a couple of revolvers, and she and her lord marched forth defying the party. And then under a brisk fire, they mounted double and galloped away unharmed. In the fullness of time, Slade's Myrmidons captured his ancient enemy, Jules, whom they found in a well-chosen hiding place in the remote fastness of the mountains, gaining a precarious livelihood with his rifle. They brought him to Rocky Ridge, bound hand and foot, and deposited him in the middle of the cattle yard with his back against a post. It is said that the pleasure that lit Slade's face when he heard of it was something fearful to contemplate. He examined his enemy to see that he was securely tied and then went to bed, content to wait till morning before enjoying the luxury of killing him. Jules spent the night in the cattle yard, and it is a region where warm nights are never known. In the morning, Slade practiced on him with his revolver, nipping the flesh here and there, and occasionally clipping off a finger, while Jules begged him to kill him outright and put him out of his misery. Finally, Slade reloaded and walking up close to his victim, made some characteristic remarks and then dispatched him. The body lay there. The body lay there half a day, nobody venturing to touch it without orders. And then Slade detailed the party and assisted at the burial himself. But he first cut off the dead man's ears and put them in his vest pocket where he carried them for some time with great satisfaction. That is the story as I have frequently heard it told and seen it in print in California newspapers. It is doubtless correct in all essential particulars. In due time, we rattled up to a stage station and sat down to breakfast with a half-savage, half-civilized company of armed and bearded mountaineers, ranchmen and station employees. The most gentlemanly appearing, quiet, an affable officer we had, had yet found along the road in the Overland's company's service was the person who sat at the head of the table at my elbow. Never youth stared and shivered as I did when I heard them call him Slade. Here was romance, and I was and I sitting face to face with it, look upon it, touching it, looking upon it, touching it, hobnobbing with it as it were. Here, right by my side, was the actual ogre who, in fights and brawls in various ways, had taken the lives of 26 human beings. For all men lied about him. I suppose I was the proudest stripling that ever traveled to see strange lands and wonderful people. He was so friendly and so genteel spoken that I warmed him in spite of his awful history. It was hardly possible to realize that this pleasant person was the pitiless scourge of the outlaws, the raw head, the raw head and bloody bones, the nursing mothers of the mountains terrify their children with. And to this day, I can remember nothing remarkable about Slade, except that his face was rather broad across the cheekbones, and that the cheekbones were low and the lips peculiarly thin and straight. But that was enough to leave something of an effect upon me, for since then I seldom see a face possessing those characteristics without fancying that the owner of it is a dangerous man. The coffee ran out. At least it was reduced to one tin cupful, and Slade was about to take it when he saw that my cup was empty. He politely offered to fill it, but although I wanted it, I politely declined. I was afraid he had not killed anybody that morning and might be needing diversion. But still, with firm politeness, he insisted on filling my cup and said I had traveled all night and better deserved it than he, 
and while he talked, he placidly poured the fluid to the last drop. I thanked him and drank it, but it gave me no comfort, for I could not feel sure that he would not be sorry presently that he had given it away and proceed to kill me to, to distract his thoughts from the loss. But nothing of the kind occurred. We left him with only 26 dead people to account for, and I felt a tranquil satisfaction in the thought that in so judiciously taking care of number one at the brec that breakfast table, I had pleasantly escaped being number 27. Slade came out to the coach and saw us off, first ordering certain rearrangements of the mailbags for our comfort, and then we took leave of him, satisfied that we should hear of, should hear of him again some day, and wondering in what connection. Chapter 11, Slade in Montana, on a spree, in court, attack on a judge, arrest by the vigilantes, turn out of the miners, execution of Slade, lamentations of his wife, was Slade a coward? And sure enough, two or three years afterward, we did hear of him again. News came to the Pacific Coast that the Vigilance Committee in Montana, whether, whither Slade had removed from Rocky Ridge, had hanged him. I find an account of the affair in the thrilling little book I quoted a paragraph from in, from in the last chapter, The Vigilantes of Montana being a reliable account of the capture, trial, and execution of Henry Plummer's notorious road agent band by a Professor Thomas J. Dimsdale, Virginia City, M.T. Mr. Dimsdale's chapter is well worth reading as a specimen of how the people of the frontier deal with criminals when the courts of law prove inefficient. <laughs> Mr. Dimsdale makes two remarks about Slade, both of which are accurately descriptive, and one of which is exceedingly picturesque. Those who saw him in his natural state only would pronounce him to be a kind husband, a most hospitable host, and a courteous gentleman. On the contrary, those who met him when maddened with liquor and surrounded by a gang of armed roughs would pronounce him, would pronounce him a fiend incarnate. And this, from Fort Kearney West, he was feared a great deal more than the Almighty. For compactness, simplicity, and vigor of expression, I will back that sentence against anything in literature. Mr. Dimsdale's narrative is as follows. In all places where italics occur, they are mine. After the execution of the five men of the fort on the 14th of January, the vigilantes considered their, that their work was nearly ended. They had freed the country of highwaymen and murderers to a great extent and they determined that in the absence of the regular civil authority, they would establish a people's court where all offenders should be tried by judge and jury. This was the nearest approach to social order that the circumstances permitted, and though strict legal authority was wanting, yet the people were firmly determined to maintain its efficiency and to enforce its decrees. It may here be mentioned that the overt act, which was the last round on the fi fatal ladder to the scaffold on which Slade perished, was the tearing in pieces and stamping upon a writ of this court, followed by his arrest of the judge, Alex, Alex da Alexander Davis, by authority of a presented derringer and with his own hands. J.A. Slade was himself, we have been informed, a vigilante, he openly boasted of it and said he knew all that they knew. He was never accused or even suspected of either murder or robbery committed in this territory. The latter crime was never laid to his charge in any place. But that he had killed several men in other localities was notorious and his bad reputation in this respect was a most powerful argument in determining his fate when he was finally arrested for the, office, for the offense above mentioned. On returning from Milk River, he became more and more addicted to drinking, until at last it was a common feat for him and his friends to take the town. He and a couple of his dependents might often be seen on one horse, galloping through the streets, shouting and yelling, firing revolvers, etc. On many occasions, 
He would ride his horse into stores, break up bars, toss the scales out of doors, and used most insulting language to the parties present. Just previous to the day of his arrest, he had given a fearful beating to one of his followers, but such was his influence over them that the man wept bitterly at the gallows and begged for his life with all his power. It had become quite common when Slade was on a spree for the shopkeepers and citizens to close the stores and put out all the lights, being fearful of some outrage at his hands. For his wanton destruction of goods and furniture, he was always ready to pay when sober, if he had money. But there were not a few who regarded payment as small satisfaction for the outrage, and these men were his personal enemies. From time to time, Slade received warnings from men that he well knew would not deceive him of the certain end of his conduct. There was not a moment for weeks previous to his arrest in which the public did not expect to hear of some bloody outrage. The dread of his very name and the presence of the armed band of hangers-on who followed him alone prevented a resistance which most certainly have ended in the instant murder or mutilation of the opposing party. Slade was frequently arrested by order of the court whose organization we have described and had treated it with respect by paying one or two fines and promising to pay the rest when he had money. But in the transaction that occurred at this crisis, he forgot even this caution and goaded by passion and the hatred of restraint, he sprang into the embrace of death. Slade had been drunk and cutting up all night. He and his companions had made the town a perfect hell. In the morning, J.M. Fox, the sheriff, met him, arrested him, took him into court, and commenced reading a warrant that he had for his arrest by way of arraignment. He became uncontrollably furious, and seizing the writ, he tore it up, threw it on the ground, and stamped upon it. The clicking of the locks of his companion's revolvers was instantly heard, and a crisis was expected. The sheriff did not attempt his retention, but being at, la at least as prudent as he was valiant, he succumbed, leaving Slade the master of the situation and the conqueror and ruler of the courts, law, and lawmakers. This was a declaration of war and was so accepted. The Vigilance Committee now felt that the question of social order and the preponderance of the law-abiding citizens had then and there to be decided. They knew the character of Slade, and they were well aware that they must submit to his rule without murmur or else that he must be dealt with in such fashion as would, as would prevent his being able to erect his, his vengeance on the com committee who could never have hoped to live in the territory secure from outrage or death and who could never leave it without encountering his friends whom his victory would have emboldened and stimulated to a pitch that would have rendered them reckless of consequences. <laughs>